Uh, good afternoon everyone, my name is Alec and I'm a member of the technical team at Quailfire and today I'm just going to do a very brief uh, short 10 minute presentation and then I'm going to be passing over thankfully to uh, Dr Andrew Taylor of the uh, ASFP, he's a technical officer and then we're going to have a panel discussion with some um, panellists from different areas that all deal with fire stopping. So the presentation I just wanted to set the scene for today is the importance of early engagement and sticking to the plan in regards to service penetration fire stopping. So why is this important? Okay. This is a very complex subject. For anyone who sat through the presentation today, you can see there's a lot to talk about. It's not as simple as just putting fire stopping, plugging some gaps around some cables or some pipes. Okay. There can be well over 30 questions that you might need to ask yourself about a service penetration type. And if you deviate from the design, you could find that your installation is non-compliant. A proactive design, not a reactive, will prevent things like this. And I can tell you now that most of them do not have a tested solution, so you'd have to start again. There is a very useful guide, as I said, I'm only going to briefly be talking about it today, and it's been put together by a number of different organisations. One of them is the ASFP, so they be quite happily to talk to you about this uh, after the round table later on. But one of the key takeaways for this when you get a chance to read it is there are eight, nine golden rules and for anyone in the audience that is a designer or an architect seven of those rules are aimed at you that's how important it is and it shows why early engagement is very important. So some of the other benefits that might help you out I mean first of all it's probably not the main thing but it is important is budget if you do early engagement, you will know, you will have a plan, you will have a design, and you can stick to it. That means everyone should be able to price accordingly, and you shouldn't have any delays. That will then mean you're on time, and that's another key factor. If you finish on time, all the uh, contractors can be organised, they can be coordinated correctly. But most importantly, using tested solutions will offer you a reasonable guarantee of performance and peace of mind and it should be the way that we're always going. And this is going to be the life safety, which is what we're all here about. So I thought we'd start from, from the end and work backwards a little bit. So the end result, for example, here, is a service penetration, a letterbox, or some might be known, having different service penetration types. There's a number of different ones there. But how many people had to be involved from start to finish to get to this point? Earlier on, it was broken down, there's two sort of stages. There's the design stage and there's the build stage. In the design stage, you can have the main contractor. They're going to be looking at the number of apartments, what type of services, the building occupancy. You're then going to have the architect and the design team. They need to factor in all the sort of tested solutions that are be there. The wall type, the floor type, the service penetrations. And you might have a number of specialists acoustic structure on fire that all need to be able to work together to make a design. When it actually comes to the install itself, you can have dry liners, plumbers, specialist sprinkler installers, duct installers, electricians, and then finally, somehow the fire stopper has to get in between all this to install suitable fire stopping uh, solutions. So we've kind of broken down the process into four steps. There's preparation, design concept, checking and approval, and then finally the build. And they're all important. If we look at preparation, there are some key things you need to identify. So the first thing you need to look at is what is your fire resistant requirements? 60 minutes and two hours, although it doesn't seem a lot, it's very hard to achieve two hours compared to 60 minutes and not all solutions can be done for certain pipes and services. You'll need to identify the construction type. It may be very common that you'll see plasterboard ceilings, but there are very little testing for service penetration through these types of supporting construction. So you need to check that there is a tested solution. And then you'll need to look at the service types. There are a number of different plastics, there are a number of different metals, service types and how they're used and you need to look at all these factors. This is quite a tall order, so what we do at Quellfire and other manufacturers will do it as well, 
because you would gather all this information. I have a, a useful form that I have that you can use, and then you would send this information to myself or another member of the technical team, and we would look at your application. What I then do is I try and match up tested solutions to what you've got and that you can consider. If I find that we haven't got something, I would try and offer you an alternative or explain to you why it's not a tested solution and maybe you need to look at a redesign. Okay, this sort of uh, whole situation is quite complex. This is just an example of one of our detailed drawings. After the round table discussion, my stand is just there. If you want to come and have a look at this in more detail, do so because I don't have enough time today. But ultimately what you're going to do is take all this information and design a specific site drawing. It's going to have all the requirements from space for the edge of aperture, space between services, those types of things. The next step, which is often overlooked, is checking and approval. Although you've now got a tested solution for your services, you need to make sure that the supporting construction type it's going to be fitted into meets their requirements, so you'll need to speak to them. You might want to check with acoustics, fire engineers, and building control. So you need to check with everyone that they're happy before we move to the build stage. So once you move to the build stage, what you're looking at doing is taking your theory and turn it into reality. And this is where all that hard work that you could have spent months doing can be ruined in a matter of minutes just because someone decides to go off script. So again, we looked at this earlier, this is all the different trades. And the big thing from this is that coordination and communication with all the trades, even if fire stopping is not in their package, they are still gonna be involved in this. They all need to be watched and checked and make sure they follow the rules and design, stick to the plan. Just a couple of examples where trades might not be involved in the fire stopping per se, but they have got a, a, a measure of um, influence in this, for example, dry liners. They'll need to know the aperture size. If they make that too big, it might not be compliant. If they don't frame and line it correctly, it might not be compliant. And there might be specific spaces between apertures that the wall manufacturer requires. So it's something you need to check. It's better to fix it at this point than to leave it to the end and have to go back. Same with ME installers. Again, they might not be installing the physical fire stopping, but they need to position their services with fire stopping in mind. The fire stoppers are going to have to get in between this, and there's going to be a certain requirement around each service type that needs to be met. Okay? So as I said, communication is key. One of the ways we're seeing this be done with a lot of main tractors on site is the use of sample boards or demo boards. And these are a great tool, a physical representation that people can have talks around get to fill. We've got some demo boards just over there you can have a look at in, uh, afterwards. And they, they can go back and check that they've done what's, what's required. We also have options where you might want to make use of manufacturers' product toolbox talks. You know, who knows their products best is going to be the manufacturer. We're happy to do that for you. Okay. So here's just an example. I've used this picture already, but this is one of the sample boards in my office. And what this can show you is the space between fire stop seals. It can show you the space from the edge of openings. You know, the, the, the first service supports, the distance from the wall, the annular size of the fire stopping that's required, bundle sizes, how many wraps are gonna be required, and even if you're allowed to have stacked air ducts, for example there. Okay, all of those solutions on that drawing were tested and they can be, uh, the test evidence can be provided. But there are requirements like spacing. Okay, here's some prime examples. These are provided by Fire Shield, a fire stopper, and they were working on a Wilmot Dixon project. And as you can see, they've got detailed drawings there and the applications, and they can use that as representation of all the trades to work off. Okay, so just wanted to talk a little bit about fire stoppers themselves. Okay, they get a lot of grief. One of the things you need to remember with fire stoppers is generally they are there to, to install tested passive fire protection solutions. They're not generally fire engineers. They don't have a magic wand to turn up and try and make everything better. Okay? You need to have them in mind at the start. You need to engage early enough that when they come, they can do us install correctly. 
So they need to be aware of specific manufacturer's details. Not all manufacturers test the same. Even though some of our products may look alike, they are different and they are tested differently. Um, they will need to have a, a, you know, installation guides, any chemical compatibility issues like that. They will need access to both sides. If you let the project run on too quickly and ceilings go up or people move in and they don't have access, they might not be able to do a compliant uh, install. And they will need to physically get between services. Most of you here, you all have quite large hands. Some of the spacings can be as little as 5 mil, 10 mil, 50 mil. You need to think with, with them in mind for the installation. What they must not do is change the design without approval and they should not mix and match manufactured products. Okay? I'm not going to go into this slide too much, but third party accreditation isn't required. It is a big thing that's being mentioned quite a lot, it's been mentioned throughout the day. It is definitely the step in the right direction. It's one of the things you might want to check and it's going to offer that level of confidence. One of the things I will say is, please still have your due diligence. You should not get complacent with third party accreditation. You still need to go out and check and make sure that they're following your design. Some products, it may not even be practical to have a third party accreditation. So in those incidents, instances, you may want to look at utilizing manufactured product, uh, product toolbox talks or make sure that someone checks the work a bit more thoroughly. Regulation 38, again, if you're using um, early engagement, one of the things you need to document is what you've done. You're gonna be handing this information pack on at the finish of the project. And if you've done it early enough, all of these documents that are shown on the screen should be readily available. It should be quite easily to keep step by step and pass on at the end of the building. Again, the fire stoppers themselves have used this, and this is again some examples where they've got their fire stopping label, and they can even link it up to sample boards and the detailed drawings they've used. So it gives you some sort of stage, step by step stage that they've done. I apologise that was very quick, but I wanted to pass on to the round table. After the round table, you can please come and speak to me afterwards. But in summary, I just wanted to highlight that it's very important that you come uh, you involve manufacturers in the early, uh, early stages of design, because we can help you on the right track. You will need to design your building and service penetrations with fire stopping in mind. Communication and coordination of all the trades, even if they're not practically installing the fire stopping, need to be watched and coordinated so they don't affect the design. You should use competent contractors, you should take advantage of manufacturers toolbox talks and record keeping, like I said, if you follow early engagement you should be able to keep the track. One of the key takeaways is you should check work after each stage, after each trade has done their thing, check it. If it's not per the design, if they've not stuck to the plan, change it there and then. If you do this, it will help you keep on budget, keep on time, but ultimately, and the main thing, is it should protect lives. Don't leave it too late and end up with stuff like this. I said sorry this was a very quick talk. I will just leave you with one final thing. My colleague Craig has this saying, and I think it's been very important and it was mentioned earlier on. Uh, Comedy is knowing what you don't know. I'm always readily available. Please use my uh, services and I'm happy to help. I will now pass over to uh, Dr. Andrew Taylor, who's the technical officer for the ASFP, and I uh, thank you very much for the time for me. Okay, thank you very much. Right, we're going to have a, a, a round table now, so you've got uh, six of us coming to the stage. And we've got us, we've told we have to sit in a very specific order um, because so that the, the person running the sound system knows who he's to talking to and who we're throwing to. So, um, thank you for, for staying. We, it's a round table. We're going to discuss fire stopping, the importance of, of considering it earlier and in greater detail in the construction process. Joined here on the, on the stage by uh, five other people who from different stages the construction process uh, and I'd ask each of them to introduce themselves once we finish playing musical chairs. Um, so you've already, you've, you've, those of you, most of you already know me, 
I was on earlier on, I'm Dr. Andrew Taylor, Tech Officer of the SMB. Um, Alex, if you'd like to introduce yourself. My name is Alex Double from ADDC. Uh, we are a drywall fire protection consultant um, specialising in design, architects design, designers design, and also the installation of passive fire protection. Andrea? Uh, yeah, so I'm Andrea White and I'm a fire engineer and clearly I can't count. Jamie? I'm oh, sorry, it's Graham. Graham. <laughs> I am Graham Whitty, I'm the National Product Director for World War Dixon Tier 1 Paper Transit. My name's Jamie Rogers, I'm uh, the Major Accounts Director of Sealand Fireproofing and we are a passive fire protection installer. Hello everyone, I'm Gray Wells, Sales Director at Crowfire. So we are manufacturers and suppliers of passive fire protection products, specifically for service penetration seals. So uh, I head up a team uh, which Alec is part of. So looking forward to uh, an interactive discussion now. Thank you. Okay. So, have we got facility for questions from the floor with a microphone over there as well? They're all shaking their heads at me. I'm happy to be a runner. You're happy to be a runner? Well, okay, right, well, I'll tell you what, we'll, we may, we'll, we'll do that in a second. I was going to start with a, a quick question. So, so, we've just had the presentation about this lovely purple booth, um, which some people sat on the stage can talk about endlessly because we were involved in drafting it, but it's another story in time. I was going to start by saying, Graham, are you seeing a difference as a main contractor in what you're doing because of what's the advice and the, and, and the guidance within this book? Yeah, I think slowly and surely we are seeing a greater realisation of the importance of what we're talking about. Um, we're seeing people being more aware, our customers asking the questions more, what you're doing, how are you going to do it, concerned about this because obviously they, the end use of the building. Um, we think it's a great document, it's a fantastic um, piece of work, not because you're just standing here up in front of me, but it also like, va uh, validates what we put into our business. So what we set out to achieve internally, this document now puts in practice in the wider public how we've work, been working for a few years now, which is fantastic. It, it covers it, not only does it give us the information of what we need to do, but it tells other contractors or other uh, parties how to achieve it as well. It's not just a list of rules, it gives us guidance and, and a process to go through to achieve the right outcome, which is excellent. I just had a seamless microphone change, I hope nobody noticed. No. Um, okay. And Jamie, as, a, as an installer, are you seeing any difference? Are you getting dragged into the, the process and, and thinking of the situation earlier? Yeah, absolutely. I think in the last 12 months when we've been working for tricky conditions, um, we're noticing that our, our key clients are reaching out to us months, years in some cases before projects are even coming out of the ground. Um, and it's refreshing to hear from the operational side of the uh, construction team saying that we've got this coming up, uh, we need to start looking at how we're going to procure the fire stopping. Um, so yeah, it's, it's very positive for my stance. It's definitely uh, improving. And then of course from the dry lining side of the point of view, what? what? Yeah, absolutely. So um, my experience is that there is, certainly with our tier one contractor clients, there's a much earlier engagement and coordination between all the relevant parties. So we, we are having weekly meetings with the mechanical, electrical um, uh, consultants, the installers, fire stopping manufacturers, contractors, uh, reviewing all of the penetration seals, not just those that are covered by Qualifier's uh, products, which is the 1366 Part 3 standards, but also fire resistant ductwork and dampers and bus bars and all the other things that go into the mix of penetration seals um, so that we can think historically it was the um, MEP side that drove the penetrations uh, uh, but now it's actually the compliant fire stopping that's driving the um, mechanic and electrical contractors in how they position their services in buildings. And that's a major change from it's what, a massive change, what we, when we started doing the... the, and, the, the and, it, and it's it's difficult, it's a really hard process, it, it, it's painful in parts and uh, I think everyone that goes down that, that route would, would say that's the same, that that is the case. But actually, that early intervention and early engagement, it, it, it pays dividends at the end of the project. Because you may let, I think we were discussing earlier, you might be left with a very small percentage of very difficult penetration seals, but if you can cover off 90, 95% of them by that early engagement and coordination, that's a real success. And, and Andrea, as a fire engineer, 
know, are you seeing any changes in what, you, what how, how things are happening or what benefits do you see from people following the news of the world? I think the thing that has traditionally happened is that fire engineers have been involved at Reba Stages 3 and 4. So we're asked to produce a fire strategy and it might not necessarily be an as-built fire strategy at the end. Um, and really we have very little involvement before that and often very little involvement after that. So, you know, the whole golden thread concept, I'm really hoping that, you know, we've got fire statements now, which is at the early stages, I'm hoping that that will carry through so that we've got more involvement um, right, th right the way through the project to actually be able to spot some of these issues and, and ask the questions, whereas in the past, we've just not been involved at those stages. And then, Craig, what, from a manufacturer's standpoint? Yeah, thanks. Uh, so, yeah, we are seeing changes, um, certainly a lot more awareness of um, the importance of asking these, as Alex has said, difficult questions, I mean, those difficult conversations up front. Um, and I think one thing I would say is it might have been particularly difficult in the past, but, you know, the industry is changing and manufacturers are responding. And that access to technical support and uh, to advice uh, is is there, um, and certainly contracted you know, manufacturers are are changing the way they provide that information more readily. Um, so don't be put off by negative experiences of the past, where it's been difficult to uh, design things early on. Um, reach out and seek some advice. But yeah, certainly some very positive changes generally. Okay, That's it. shall we? Um, now we've done loads of these virtually. Um, whenever you're doing a virtually, you get loads of questions coming through the chat. So please don't be shy. Are there any questions from the floor for this panel that you see sat in front of you? Or do I? Any? Okay. Have you got some up your sleeve? I've got a few up my sleeve, but I haven't got, I haven't got another 40 minutes worth up my sleeve, that's for certain. Um, okay. So, so, right, so, here we go. Um, Graham, from your point of view, I'll, I'll start with you again, why not? What's the, what, what are the benefits you see for, for early engagement? What are, the, what are the key things that you, benefits that it gives, gives you? I think one of the key ones that we want as a contractor is certainty. So if we know what we're doing, we can plan around it. And up until quite recently, fire stopping in general was just left uh, to the site teams to sort out at various levels, which in hindsight is an incredibly dangerous thing to do, very irresponsible. And it was, it was patchy in, in our business and in other people's businesses as well, if I'm being brutally honest. But it's early engagement forces that uh, collaboration with all the key parties. There's no one person responsible for fire, uh, fire protecting of a, uh, a building. So we need the fire engineer and architect to understand how the building is designed holistically. We then need our MLE contractors, our dry liners, our fire stopping contractors to work together to see the multiple pieces of memory penetration. It doesn't all sit in one person's remit. And this, this type of approach you know, gives massive benefits, establishing it right from the outset, allowing us to plan and then allowing us to deliver out the site. Because the least we have to worry, the less we have to worry about out the site, the better design it all in house. I mean presumably presumably as well as seeing as well as seeing um, benefits in terms of, to say, certainty in terms of knowing what you're delivering and you've got that down. There must be a benefit because it must make like Jamie's life easier and therefore Jamie's life, Jamie's cost to you cheaper. Well definitely yes, there is a, there is a commercial advantage to designing it earlier. So, so that's bad news then Jamie. <laughs> cheaper for us doing it once. Cheaper doing it once, yeah. But it's also eliminating that risk. It's like if we don't know what we're doing there's a risk there and Jamie might have a solution and Qualify might have a solution, they might not, we might end up with a detail that hasn't been tested, and then what do we do? We're taking stuff down, we're rebuilding stuff, so, and that's the worst thing to do. And this is bad news for Andrea then, because the risk of the, the, risk of the fire engineering work to be done. I think from my perspective, I do quite a bit of external war work, and obviously passive is hidden, and you end up having to make holes to find out whether it's, you know, standard of passive or a not so good standard of passive. You know, it would be great if there was some documentation, some photographs and stuff of buildings. If 
I go to a building that's literally just been finished, if there's no photographs of what those walls look like behind the plasterboard, it, it's all hidden. The passive, exciting stuff is all hidden. You know, um, I'm going to have to ask people to, to damage that lovely new building to establish what the situation is if someone hasn't taken some photographs. So I think, you know, the whole planning thing would be great so that, you know, when I come to do a fire risk assessment or something, I can actually have some certainty without damaging the building or an external wall survey. I can actually look at some evidence that doesn't require me to ask for the, dam for the, for the building to be damaged again. And so again, from that, with it, Jamie, what sort of records would you typically take when you're installing? So, all records um, are, are digitally recorded, uh, photographed, um, it links into competency as well. Um, you know, we need to be able to uh, take good photographs, record good records. Um, if you don't do that, then the records aren't worth anything. Um, we, we have all our records on a digital portal, and they're fully accessible, fully transparent, live, GPS. Um, and again, that links into earlier uh, discussions on the Golden Thread. Um, we need to ensure that you know, provide information and it can be accessed at any given point. Yeah, because I mean the Golden Thread is coming. There's, there's a really nice presentation about that earlier on. That's really good. I'm sorry. Um, okay, fair enough. So, so you know, we, we've we've seen that the collaboration and working together is is the key. Um, how easy is it to stick to the plan, Alex? Do you ever see you know, how, you're the, one of the first people to go to site. How do you, how easy is it to stick to the plan and what the hurdles that you come across? Yeah, I suppose it's uh, an attitude on, on site. Some jobs are very good and, and some aren't so good. Um, I'm fortunate the ones I'm involved with tend to stick to the plan because we're engaged by our clients because there's a desire for them to, to, to adopt those good practices. We often get called into projects that we haven't had uh, involvement in from the outset or might be one that's been already constructed and you can see clearly that things have come off the rails and the plan hasn't been stuck to and then that's a, a much bigger problem. Um, the, the, what Jamie describes, the record keeping, is, 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 is great and we, we see that on a lot of our uh, uh, larger projects. Some of the smaller projects that we get involved with, that record keeping isn't quite as good um, and we rely on that, that information, that evidence of what's being built. Um, and I think it's just something that you need to you need to get this this in place really early on in the design stage. The discussion about penetration steel seals and and fire stopping and, and and make it a point on the agenda that you stick to the plan. You come up with the rate the regime of what you're going to do, and it's it's tracked and recorded. And they make someone takes ownership that they follow that through and ensure that that, that plan is kept to at all times. Because if you don't, you yeah. end up with the problems that yeah. we, we, we often see. I've got a, a question for any of you, really. Um, so, uh, do you have an example of something where you know best practice, or what you uh, something that you've adopted recently as a result of the guide, or, or well, that would help uh, and help people to understand what best practice looks like when installing fire stop? Go on, Andrew. and then you can keep on adding various um, cables. Yep. That's a really good one that I tell my clients about a lot because, you know, with the best will in the world, when you design a building, somebody in IT or, you know, other electrical contractors and things are going to want extra cables. So trying to future-proof the, the fire stopping by having some sort of flexibility Yep. That's that's a really good product. I like I like how how we can try and incorporate that with a bit of forethought. Yeah, and certainly that's a that's a really good one. So you, you build in some some future proofing into the system, and design that in so that mod modifications are, are, can be taken account of. Anybody else, Ray? Yeah, just a simple one. Uh, I was handing uh, building was being handed over to a customer quite recently. I was doing a walk around, went into a riser cupboard, looked up and I could see cables disappearing out of the riser into a ceiling. And that's classic, you know, it's going through a fire department. So the other side is all ceiling up. It's so like, well, I can't see if there is fire stopping there or not. Can you demonstrate that to me and ask the question, the side team starts scratching their head to go, we're going to get some step ladders and it's going to be a right pain in the bump. 
and um, one of the, the contracts manager from the Firestorm company went two seconds, opened up his tablet, three clicks on the button, showed me the photograph of the other side of the wall, signed, sealed, delivered, thank you very much, went my merry way, sight team, breathe a huge sigh relief. That's what it gives us, and that's on day one. Imagine that benefit in five, ten years' time. Looking at your assets, provided, it's provided somebody doesn't lose that file. That, that's another <laughs> key issue. That's, that's a worry. And, you know, data security and the golden thread. It's hopefully going to unpick some of these issues. Thread, sorry, so, um, get to the bottom of some of these issues of compatibility and longevity of information. So if it sits with one provider that we can't get access to, that information is gone. So that is a concern. Yeah, no, it is, Andrew. You know, information is great, photographs are great, but labelling them or putting them into a context, showing me, you know, this much of a product without the context of where it is, is, is no help to me. If I can see that I've got various rooms or various locations. Knowing, um, knowing the location, knowing yeah, what the products actually are. Actually having context of what those photographs is. I get some lovely photographs, but but you don't actually know what you're looking at. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, it does. It's a, it's a really good point. It is, you know, the, the picture on its own is, is, is not worth anything without the context of what it is you're looking at, where it is, and or and, and attached to the certification that underpins it. Well, great. Yeah, well, there's, there's some great exhibitors here who have got some of this technology, this emerging technology that ties in you know, 3D photography with geolocation. Um, this, is where, this is where we need to go. We need to have this accurate record that you can tell on grid line two, second floor up, behind that cupboard, I know exactly where it is. And there are some great exhibitors here who are going in this direction. But some of it's in early days, it will get better. Uh, but we just need to invest in a bit and try it, get, get used to using it as well. And get everyone used to using it, not only from the contractor side, but customer side as well. Because they, they own these buildings for 30 years. The FM providers need to come on the journey as well. I'm just, we were obviously referring in the presentation to the use of uh, sample boards and, and demo walls. Um, certainly that's something that we've seen as a, a great adoption of a best practice. It's all very well having nice manufacturers' drawings, but tradesmen in particular, or tradespeople in particular, you know, relate to real products in real life situations. Um, so there are lots of benefits to doing those sample walls, those de demo boards. Uh, there's, the, there's the tangible um, effect of actually looking seeing and feeling um, but also it provides a central location by which you can coordinate all the trades so you can bring all the, the MD contractors the dry liners the fire stopper and indeed the consultants that come and do their weekly visits their monthly visits whatever it is um, and as Andrew says you know looking at a drawing is, is or a photograph is one thing but actually having it referenced back to the sample board is very very, very beneficial um, as a consultant and have a look at the sample board. Does this real life example replicate the drawing? Does it replicate the sample? Um, so that's something we are seeing uh, definitely the benefits are a good best practice. And uh, as I said, we've, we've shown some images of how that can happen. But... Okay. Uh, the, the, the previous speaker, I don't know if you saw him, he's currently over there on his hand, um, he spoke uh, at length about competency. And so I was just going to ask each of you in turn um, what, what are you doing? about competency, what are your plans about competency, what are you doing to ensure that you're, the people who are working for you, with you, around you, are competent to do what they're, what they're doing with respect to passive fire protection? It's a really nice open question. Do you want to go first, Alex? Yeah, um, yeah, it's, it's quite a loaded um, question really. Competency is a very difficult thing to define because everyone will have their own view and interpretation of that. Um, so from the passive fire stopping perspective, we would look to see that the, um, the installers are, are third party certified. I think that's the, the minimum requirement. Um, I think we've had the discussion before, you know, a man in a van with a, white, uh, with a knife and a bit of fat doesn't make a fire stopper. They need the certification. And that, that's a starting point. And using the third party certified products as well. And also to show that they are engaged and uh, training, you know, continual professional development of all, all the staff members. So engagement with the manufacturers to come to site to to describe their products, uh, explain how they should be compliantly installed, etc. 
explain the reasons why and how things do work. I think if you have an understanding of how things work, that makes you a better, better understanding of how you can install things compliantly. And I think all of those things can add to, um, to competency. I mean, it's very difficult. You're not going to go out and get a degree in installation of fire stopping. So you've got to look at other means of, of, of developing those skills and continually training. Um, there's lots of help. And so I did a lot with dry lining. And I speak to a lot of our drywall contractors about the kind of training that they offer their, their operatives. And there's an awful lot of health and safety training that goes on. But very rarely do we hear that there's a toolbox tool to describe how to build a shaft compliantly. Or, or even, I think with competency as well, comes the you know, crate qualifier. The, the method of installing their systems will differ from their competitors. And I think you need to, another part of competency is ensuring that the the knowledge and skill is, 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 is ingrained into people that there are differences between all the systems and you need to develop that training each time. And also ask your, you know, we, we've got a pool of labour out there that, you know, that, that comes in to work for fast double contractors and the first thing you should ask them is what experience do they have using that particular system, that particular manufacturer's product. So it, it's all about training, questioning and developing those skills. I can sit here smugly and say that I've just done the level 3 ASFP course in passive. You can sit there smugly in January when you've got the results, yes. as can I, because I've just done it as well. I, I hope that I've passed, yeah, so I attended the course with Phil Brownhill and very good it was too. Um, so I think for me... Of work, they need to know what they're looking at and what they don't know, things like that. Um, our supply chain partners, we need to establish what competency levels we will accept as a business. So our, our whole industry, not only just the fire stopping areas, is fragmented with training and knowledge and competency. And it's an absolute minefield of what is good and what is bad. Uh, and you really have to be very careful. So we soon found this and the only way to establish competency levels across the whole of our, uh, whole of our business across the country was to set it for ourselves. We couldn't use national national bodies and just say go follow that, that will be that, that's what we need. So we've had to look at individual trades, individual packages and say this is what we believe for our company from these bodies. And the UCAS standard is the gold standard for us, it means I don't have to worry about that certification scheme. Fantastic. The next level is about the, the competence of the supervisor signing work off and saying it's right, it's complete and on site. What's their competency in that field? And the last one is the operative, the guy with the bread knife doing the works and the mastic done. I don't expect him to have all of those competencies. It's not realistic for me to expect the entire workforce to be at that high level. The, at his minimum, he needs to know, they need to know, sorry, exactly what they're doing with those products on that day. But that's where the toolbox talks is in value. So they might have been installing other products the week before, come onto our site and installing qualifiers products. Have you had a toolbox talk on the qualifier intermessive laps? Yes, no, no, right, so now. And then you're, you're assured that people know what they're doing that day, know what they're going to sign off on, and as a company, we know that they've got the process in the background that give us assurance that they're doing the right things. I'll, um, I'll echo what uh, Alex said around um, there's not a one stop shop qualification assessment assessed. We need to have operatives, MVQ level 2, minimum trained. Um, we have to have ongoing engagement with the likes of qualifier and manufacturers. Um, and then as a business, we need to ensure that we're inducting our operatives and supervisors uh, correctly, carrying out constructive testing. Um, we also have senior leadership teams doing monthly reports uh, and checking. Um, it's an ongoing process. It's not a one-stop qualification as such at the moment, but it's about making sure that we're being very proactive uh, on the matter. Lastly. Yeah, well, coming at it from a manufacturer's perspective, obviously um, we we need to seek the advice of those that know more than us. So whether it's the, the test laboratories, um, whether it's the likes of the ASFB, um, and as I would say, knowing what we don't know and um, finding out where we can get that advice. So I think a um, you know, key takeaway for installers is you know, don't just take what it says on the data sheet um, as being everything, um, look into it, know more detail about the testing scope of application. Um, we, we often talk at these events about uh, fire foam, for instance, it says four hours on the tin. You know, people think 
well, I've run it, it says four hours, I can use it in any application four hours. No, it would be four hours in a particular application. So know the limitations of your knowledge, reach out to those that can advise you further. And yeah, from our perspective as a company, you know, we have to keep training, keep growing our knowledge. Um, the likes of the SFB are running you know, fantastic courses where you can get more knowledge on these subjects. But Andrew, you're, you're, it's one of your pet subjects, competency, so. Oh, well, I was going to say, I mean, we've, yeah, pet subject from competency, um, from, a, from an ASFP standpoint, we're, we're looking at, at competency and, and how our members show their competency and what we can do. Um, the training that we've, we've, we, systems that we offer, that covers a lot of the, the knowledge at the moment, but governments, we now will have talked about this earlier on, um, governments defined in college competency in terms of skills, knowledge, experience, and behaviour. Um, so, you know, for this, the, we've got the stuff down, we know what that is. There's some skills stuff in terms of the actual installers and the, and the people who are built doing it, how, how they've got the skills to do that, the training to do that, and how you keep that up to date. You know, just because you've been doing it for 20 years doesn't mean you've been doing it the right way for 20 years. You could have been doing it wrong all this time. Somebody will probably point out to me that I have at some point, you know. Um, and, and, then, and then the behaviours, and that's the, 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 both the behaviour of the individual and the corporate behaviour. You know, I mean, corporate behaviour corporate behavior says we put safety first, not, not, not ease job and profit first. And that's a, that's a, a real, real thing that, that we need, we need to, in some way, shape or form. There's, there are a number of things from that point of view, like the building safety charter, that people can sign up to as, and, and adopt those policies as a way of showing that, that, that behavioural shift that we're going we're gonna to do this. And that's going to be, that's going to be really important. And it's going to be really, it's going to be a touch really difficult thing that we're going to define over the next, over the next 12, 18 months as we go through that. Yeah? And, and we're working, Niall and I are working with, within the WG2 group, actually on a, a future competence scheme for fire stopping installers as an industry response group, which will be passed through the interim industry competence committee that HSE has. And, and, and sorry, and, 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 and so there will be stuff, there is going to be stuff coming forwards on that. So that we hope that's going to make some sense, make some difference, and improve what's going on in the market. And, as it, I suppose what's to can I, do you mind, is, shall we do a, a, a wrap up questions does anybody want to to give us w w one final thought for each I just wonder whether there's any anybody's brewed any questions in the meantime on the floor oh excellent well, he, we have one can we have a microphone to this this fine person here oh that's where can that work <laughs> Um, yeah, just have two questions actually. Um, when you talk about competency and the use of products and that different manufacturers have got different products and they should be used correctly, do qualifier, uh, qualify envision having their own competency for contractors to say these have gone through our training products with our, with our products, they've gone through the training, they understand it and they're now competent to use those products. Is that something that you thought about, or is that something that's in place at the moment? Yeah, so I think the driver would be the third party accreditation, that's, um, but, but as part of that accreditation, the, the, the accreditation people would normally expect um, installers to have some manufacturer training. So, um, speaking for Bravo, yes, we do offer that to installers. Um, it's not an officially recognised qualification at MEQ, etc., but yes, uh, manufacturer specific. Training is available and certificates of attendance um, for that are going to be. Uh, the other question was more around buildings that exist and passive fire stopping in buildings. Like, you know, I work for a company who got a lot of hospital estate and you know, it's coming to 20, 30 years old. There's a lot of penetrations, a lot of um, yes, yeah, stuff that's happened in its duration, variations, etc. So there's a lot of focus on find and fix passive fire. How does that work with products when you, you might not have the certification of what's been built, um, you might not have all the details of what's been built, and um, you might not, 
you know, if, you, if you're in an IF hospital and you need to install something that day and you don't have the ins and outs of what's there beforehand, how does that work and how can you be flexible around, around that or is it a case that you've got to take it away, design it and then come back and fix it for each penetration? You're looking at me, so I'll, I'll no. kick off for it. So I, I guess what you're, you're saying is um, there's a scenario where you need to fire stop that day and you're not sure there's any tested detail for that application. Is that a summary? I suppose it's more about flexibility. So if you're there on the day, um, you're not necessarily going to do a, a full survey of the whole site to know where all the penetrations are and to know what all the details are coming to. So, if you get there on the day to do a pacifier installation, you, you have some knowledge of what the walls construction is, um, what you're likely to find, but not necessarily the gaps in between service penetrations, etc. So is there a scope of parameters that you work to? Um, I suppose, that's my from a natural contractor's point of view, would you then look at it, assess it, and then come back? Um, I think I know uh, what you're getting at there. Yeah, so if, if we were called in to look at something that was perhaps urgent, um, we would certainly need to scope that out beforehand. It wouldn't be the case of calling us up, uh, bringing materials with you, um, because we'd be sat there doing nothing. Um, we would need to be called in, especially if it is an existing building, a live building. There'd be a lot of uh, logistics to organise. Um, but in terms of uh, remedial works, yes, it would be something we would need to take away. Uh, yeah, it's with specialist manufacturers, consultants, Depending on how severe the scenarios are, yeah, sound is those ones, they're not quick fixes, um, otherwise, we're just putting in new what's not I mean, I, like I said, from a, from a fire stopping standpoint, it, you know, it, it needs to be to the testing detail, it needs to be a certified detail. You know, it, it, if you always run the risk if you, if you start thinking, well, it's close enough. You know, I, who's got the um, ability to who's got the ability to work out that, that what that close enough means because we've we've seen examples in, in some of the stuff that Niall and I see regularly where where you know it may have been considered close enough but it wasn't it was shocking and and you run the risk by doing by by thinking well you know I've got to do this now and rushing it you are going to get it wrong and you could actually make mistakes you've got to plan this you've got to plan this properly you know we've got lots of of tested details and the, the guidance will be there and say you know, get it you know yes get it right it's, and I suppose what we're trying to say now is is if you plan this and do it plan it properly then hopefully you never find yourself in that situation going forwards that would be the holy grail no it's alright it's alright this is where the uh, record keeping is imperative Projects from now, it's, it's not a problem. We've probably got really good records, photographs, digital photography. We look at a lot of hospitals in particular, a good case in point. You go in and you try and find an O&M manual of what's being installed. You can't even find the manufacturer of the product, let alone anything else. So, you know, the safe position is that you have to, if you, if you can't, if you can't work out what's being installed, the manufacturer, I think you've kind of got to go back to grassroots and think about starting again. And that, as painful as that is. It all comes down to evidence. If you, if you can't find it, you've got to then start again, really. Nick Jenkins from IFC, carrying on the, on the theme of tested details. Quite often you'll have a tested detail for a, an intermittent based cavity barrier, there may be an additionally tested detail for a pipe collar, but the scenario in reality is a combination of the two and it's not possible to to actually have a test of that combination because it's an ad hoc test and you can't deliver it within the confines of any any defined standard and, and that's really the situation you have on many buildings that they sit outside of, of scenarios but there are test standards to, to allow and, you to and, assess. Well, yeah, you've got issues where you've got um, you know, multiple things tested to completely different standards interfacing with one another. Uh, I, I, I turn around to you and say there's a, there's a set of guidance and rules for how you do uh, uh, assessments to cover that 
and because you have to do an assessment to cover that, because as you said, there is no standard, um, and, that will be, uh, and that's a, a document produced by the Passive Fire Protection Forum. It's a guide on how you conduct these, and it considers the, 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 the make sure you've got the right and appropriate data to open it, and who the competent, pe competent people are who could make that sort of a judgment. And the point there is that technical evaluations and engineering judgments, they have their place. Um, you know, both, both questions, I think, cover that really. Um, there will be situations that arise where there is no perfectly tested scenario. So, yes, these, these technical evaluations, call them what you want, have their place. But they should be done, as you say, in accordance with the PFBF guidelines. And they must be based on primary test evidence. Um, and again, it's the competency thing. You know, who, is, who is doing that technical evaluation? It's not the fire stoppers in place to be doing that. They're an installer of product. Um, we're going to refer to the you know, UK's accredited labs that, that can do these evaluations. Um, I missed the company from the IFC. Yeah. So uh, I guess there's a bit of a plug there for yourselves as well um, in, in some respect. So yes, they have their place, but it takes time. So I guess what we're saying is early engagement. Hopefully we can design out these issues that don't need these evaluations, these untested scenarios. But where worst case scenario is, then follow the correct procedures. And again, knowing who can do them um, and, and why they're qualified to do them is very important. Okay, have we got time for one more question maybe from the floor? No? Okay. All right, well, in that case, uh, we'll just, just one last thought for me. Everybody will stop. You are in Craig, and then if, hopefully. Um, well, I just round off by thanking everyone for attending and their interest. Um, early engagement and stick with the plan is something that we at Bob feel very passionately about. Um, as I alluded to earlier, it's something we can help with. And uh, all I'd say is if you've got any questions, any requirements, we'd be very glad to hear from you. And um, you know, don't be put off by negative experience in the past when you haven't been able to get information and um, you can't go to work with, with uh, testing details. Um, the industry is changing, gears manufacturers are changing, and uh, we're glad to help them. Don, um, the more we input the early stages, the easier the construction phase is for everyone uh, operationally, uh, health and safety, and ultimate compliance. Very similar. It's, there's been so many studies that show early engagement gives better results in projects. We've seen it in our own business, we're massive advocates of it, and we just probably recommend everyone to pay. The more you pay attention to fire stopping in general, uh, the more you understand how complicated it is and how easy it is to get it wrong. Also, how relatively easy it is to get it right, first doors as well. Bye. Bye. Yeah. I would say um, assume nothing. Assume nothing. So, um, there are no stupid questions, and actually, um, you do need to question. Assume nothing, because you know the last 20 years has told me that that's that's really really important. What, what you what you assume is quite possibly not a valid assumption. So I would say assume nothing. And I would just say that early engagement does work. You know, we know that from our own experience on projects we're working on at the moment. And uh, the thing that we need to have is good communication. You know, speak to your fire stopping manufacturers. Tell them what you've got on your project. See what they can help you with. And then you'll whittle down to the bits that are going to be the problems. And then you can work on those before you start building, long before you start building. And, and I would lastly say that there are a few more copies of this on the ASFP stamp. So for anyone that's not seen it, downloaded it, you can get yourself a, a proper hard copy. And if you ask really nicely, Alex and I might autograph it for you. Um, <laughs> thank you very much for uh, listening. Thank you very much for attending to the questions. hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you found it useful. Um, maybe see you again next year. Thank you very much.